last week saw another failed painting restoration in Spain and the world just can't stop making fun of it. Memes of the ruined 17th century work of Baroque artist Bartolomé Staban Murillo are all over social media. It happened when an art collector handed his copy over to a furniture restorer and this is how it turned out after two attempts to fix it. Let's talk to Sarah Crofts, Chief Executive of the Institute of Conservation in London. Hi Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. So, let's just start with this. Why would an art collector hand over such an important painting to a furniture restorer in the first place? I mean, is this just a financial worries or lack of knowledge or what exactly is going on here? Okay, I, I'm guessing that the, the collector valued their copy of this lovely painting and they wanted the best thing for it. But talking to uh, a colleague who worked with me who was born and brought up in Spain last week, she made an interesting observation that there is a culture in parts of Spain where if you need something fixed in your community, you ask someone in your community. And it may be that it's as simple as that, that they they thought they were doing the right thing, but uh, sadly the person who, who did the work didn't have uh, the right skills uh, for the particular task in hand. Okay, so by the sounds of it, I have a very valuable artwork and then I can just take it to anyone and, you know, they can do anything they want to it. Absolutely no legislation on that. Is that the case? Certainly with artworks, they're not protected in the way that our lovely buildings and monuments and archaeology are. And certainly also within museums, we wouldn't be concerned that such a thing would happen. But yeah, where private individuals and objects, they can do what they wish. And that's the same for us in the UK as it is for people in Spain and many countries. Uh, it's the job of organisations like, um, like ICON um, and like Acre in Spain to try and encourage members of the public to go and seek out the expertise when they need it. Okay, you said encourage, but is it enough? I mean, just encouragement, uh, where would it take people? I mean, how far can we go with that? Do you think uh, some sort of tightening of the laws is needed at one point? I would tend to prefer carrots rather than sticks, um, to use that expression. So for, for us, we have um, accreditation. So our members, our conservators, uh, are accredited. They have a, a standard that they live up to, and that comes with a code of conduct, which means that if they do something that's not correct, people have a way to, to get redress, that they can deal with that. Um, so that we use effectively self-regulation. And I, th that, when it works well, is really good, but that means that people need to know that that exists. And mm -hmm. there's a job for governments, for heritage societies, to promote accreditation and professional standards, to encourage rather than to, um, to beat people up when things go wrong. Okay, so is there any penalty for such incidents? I mean, I'm just assuming that if there is a lot of money involved, I'm sure there is some sort of penalty, but can you please clear it for us? If there's no regulation, there won't be any penalty in that sense, but I would assume that a collector who had a, a piece of work that was damaged by someone, either unwittingly or knowingly, that they would probably have to seek redress through the court system to have someone else uh, to put right the damage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with Murillo's painting, uh, we've heard that the collector, I mean now the owner of the painting, he has contacted another specialist to fix it. But are these kind of damages reversible? They should be. You can't ever go back to exactly what was there before, particularly if, if some of the paint was removed as part of the botched restoration. But it would be possible for a skilled paintings conservator to remove what was done recently and then to recreate what was there before because we've got plenty of pictures of how it looks we know what it should look like mm -hmm. so it won't be quite the same thing it's lost some uh, authenticity along the way but it could be made to look as it ought to okay so you say that we mostly know what it should look like and then we don't really go to like um i don't know a restorer or a conservator for this 
could it could the reason be that we don't have enough uh, properly trained conservators? It's possible. There's certainly um, scope for more people to come into the profession. But I think it's probably more about visibility that um, making sure that collectors, members of the public, know that there are people who have the skills and expertise to do this job. So to champion the good work that's done elsewhere and to show the value of that, that it's a good thing to look after these lovely paintings and objects. Mm. And would you say that uh, conservation restoration profession is, you know, at, at risk of um, disappearing or what kind of a situation is it in? I, I think it will be interesting, given what's happened with coronavirus, whether there are still people who can pay to have the work done and if that has a long term impact, whether people leave the profession. But certainly I know that for ourselves and for colleagues and where we work very hard to promote training courses in conservation and there is huge appetite for people to learn and to be part of it. So I think there's there's every chance that we can continue to to bring on the new generation of paintings conservators because we will continue to love our paintings and want to care for them. And how do I become an art restorer or a conservator? What kind of a training do I have to take for that? Oh, well, if you were in the UK, you would probably start with um, some sort of um, undergraduate degree, probably in the arts, and then you would quite likely go on and take a master's degree in conservation, where you would learn the real nitty gritty of the techniques as well as the philosophical background. But also you would want to spend quite a bit of time working in practice, maybe doing an internship or something like that, to learn how things actually get done in the workplace. So it's it's quite a long training course, but then people come out of it with an amazing skill. All right, Sarah Crofts, it was good to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today.